Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you for, for joining us today for the inaugural event for SCALE. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you today. I'm the program director for Starburst, working on building our early stage accelerator programs here. Um, and as an entrepreneur and a longtime Silicon Beach community member, I'm really excited to be here with you and supporting this initiative in collaboration with UCLA right here in Los Angeles. Um, for those of you who don't know Starburst, we're the world's first and only global aerospace incubator. Uh, we've been working with we've been working with <laughs> with aerospace startups from pre pre seed through Series A and beyond since 2013. Um, Starburst works with Star with aerospace startups uh, all across the aerospace verticals, serving as an innovation catalyst in the, in the aerospace industry. Um, we work as well with corporate, academic, and government partners. We connect to those partners with, uh, with startups to help them source disruptive technology. And on the startup side, we help them integrate into the industry and get their products out into market faster. Uh, so SCALE is an early stage accelerator uh, focused on a 13 week program to help bring, to help companies grow and establish themselves in the market. Um, it will serve as, it'll serve as a platform for entrepreneurs to launch and scale the businesses here in LA. Um, and the program is really desired to, designed to inspire a generation of students, entrepreneurs and investors to work in aerospace. Um, we want to highlight the, the breadth of technologies and applications and opportunities that are in this space today. Um, so I want, to, uh, I want to give a quick thank you to our team who are on the back end making this happen. So thank you to Liz and April uh, for facilitating all of this. Um, today, we will talk about innovation in technology and mobility from transportation as a service to automation to aviation to space, uh, looking at everything through the lens of LA. Uh, there will be time for some Q&A during the startup presentations. If you do have questions, please use the Q&A feature. You should see that at the top of your screen to submit your questions and our team will read those out for you uh, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, to start today, we're going to hear a few opening remarks from Senator Ben Allen. Well, hi everybody, uh, California State Senator Ben Allen here, and I'm so proud to represent the 26th Senate District, which is the Hollywood, Westside and Coastal South Bay communities of Los Angeles County. Uh, where, of course, California Aerospace and Innovation have played such an important role in the development of, of my communities and, and their, their local economy and created a lot of jobs. You know, California has been at the heart of so much of, of what's made the global development of aviation and aerospace great. You look at the Mars landings, the space shuttle, the B-2 stealth bombers, uh, the GPS system, our climate change and weather monitoring satellites, and, and, so, and so much more. And with a combined contribution of over $170 billion to the state and over 1 million em individuals employed, the aviation and aerospace industries continue to be really important economic drivers for our state. And it's my hope that with the hope of public-private partnership program in California will maintain its status as the innovative aerospace capital of the world during this, this next age of new space entrepreneurship and, and, and aerospace industry growth. So today, I'm so excited to, uh, to, to celebrate Starburst expansion in California with SCALE, which is an accelerator for pre-seed and seed stage aerospace startups in the LA region. Ensuring the aerospace and defense talent pipeline remains strong in our Southern California economy is, is really critical uh, to the preservation of our region's leadership in this area. And that's why I'm, I'm just so proud to support the SCALE partnership between Starburst and UCLA. Scale is, is truly a one-of-a-kind a, you know, one, one one opportunity for industry, government, innovators, uh, the academy, and investors to come together and support engineering students in aerospace startups and promote technological development and economic growth at the same time. So congratulations, and I'm excited to watch, partner, and support as this program takes flight. 
Um, we're really happy to have uh, have the support of Senator Allen, who's been a great proponent of this from the beginning. Um, next, I want to welcome Raj Kapoor, Chief Strategy Officer at Lyft. Um, Raj, you are welcome to turn on your, your video and mic. Um, Lyft is a leader in the mobility space, uh, innovating on autonomous, shared, connected, and electric transportation. Um, we're really honored to have you here today, Raj. So I'm gonna turn off uh, my screen share and let you take it from here. All right, I did, can everyone hear me okay? I'm gonna put this into presentation mode. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, and the screen is working? Yep. No glitches in the matrix. Great. Uh, <laughs> happy to be here and uh, excited for this kickoff. Uh, so as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm the chief strategy officer at Lyft. Um, I've also been an entrepreneur, started a few companies, Snapfish and Online Photos, FitMob, which is now part of ClassPass in the fitness marketplace business. Um, I was a VC for seven years at a partner at Mayfield Fund. And at that time, I was really fascinated with marketplaces. Uh, which have these winner take all effects or winner take most effects. And also I saw in 2006, um, started to really understand what's going on with our climate and the climate change challenge that we have. So I wanted to find something that could make transportation more efficient. Found this company called Zimride, which later like most companies pivoted into, uh, into Lyft. So I'm here to talk to you a little bit about more broadly the future of mobility, but I will call upon some Lyft examples uh, since I did learn through that. So it's always good to start with what is the challenge that we face? The challenge is that urbanization, despite the COVID pandemic, which hopefully will be gone soon, uh, is happening at a very rapid clip and is increasing. So uh, two and a half billion people are gonna be moving into cities over the next decade or so. Um, and we're going to have roughly two thirds of the entire world's population in cities. That sounds great for an efficiency perspective and people also being connected and close to each other, which is needed more than ever post pandemic. But it's not great when you look when you look at our transportation and mobility infrastructure. Um, we have some serious challenges there. And one of them is caused by the fact that cities are really made around cars and people are driving to work alone. Over three quarters of people are driving to work alone. Uh, in addition to that, it's unsafe. People are dying uh, from car accidents that are unnecessary due to distractions. And even a larger amount of people are, are dying from vehicle emission exposure through various diseases. And if you look at what's going on with cities, we have a housing crisis in a lot of places. A very, in LA itself, 14% of it is parking, which just doesn't make sense, um, especially given the fact that consumers are using their car maybe just 4% of the time. 96% of the time, it's idle. Um, in doing it. So uh, McKinsey, along with C40, which is a group of mayors that really care deeply around climate that was convened by Michael Bloomberg, did an extensive study over the last few years around how can we solve the transportation crisis that's looming in cities. And they said, whatever the solution is, has to hit these five points, which are pretty obvious. It has to be affordable so that everyone can use it. Um, it needs to be available. In other words, it needs to be something that is 24 seven. Um, it's only a few minutes away. You can't, you can't be waiting around for it. Convenience, uh, people don't like to walk, but even though it's good for you, walking a little bit uh, at most uh, to get to it. And then efficiency. Um, so we don't have these single use cars on there um, so that we have a more efficient use of our roadways through shared transportation like transit. And then sustainability is the final thing, which is around emissions and also just the use of energy. So the question is, what is the solution that really gets all these together? What is the future of it? And I would argue that uh, a big part of this is going to be moving us from ownership to access, moving us from owning a car to transportation as a service, very similar to how you consume movies and, and video entertainment coming out of LA. Um, and in music on Spotify, where you're subscribing it and using it as you go. At Lyft, this is something that we've been focused on in the last few years, so I will refer back to Lyft here. And we've created a, a subscription called Lyft Pink, which encompasses all of the transportation as a service options so you don't have to own a car. Rideshare, which everyone's familiar with. We own most of the bike share in the country. 
Um, we're integrated with transit. You can do payments from the app, sc electric scooters, of course, and then rentals so that if you want to go away for a weekend, you don't have to just take a lift. You can have the car. So bundling this together into one subscription is going to start to make a dent on this problem in car ownership. But the future holds more than that, uh, which I will get to. The question then is, is that really effective? And this McKinsey Center also agrees around transportation as a service. And after they ran a lot of models, they found that it could improve all five factors at the same time. You could accommodate more cars. You could cut down travel time, 25% less cost, increase the number of trips and lower emissions. So it's like a win-win if we can move to transportation as a service. Another piece that's important is that we also need to move, for example, in the automotive space from these single use cars that are gas guzzling to a self-driving electric shared fleet so that we have less cars, we don't have emissions and self-driving is safer and cheaper as well in doing it. But this is gonna cause a huge amount of uh, innovation that's gonna be there. We can rethink the way that we think about transportation. It doesn't have to be around wasting time in the car. It can be having productive time in the car. So this is a artist example of how you can swip around to a, a table and get some work done on it. Other examples that are there is that we've designed cars until now for the least common denominator. And so it has to do everything, the pocket knife. You may have modes and cabins that are there such that you can do uh, a sleep lift, as an example, a social lift where the social events occurring while you're moving. And of course, you can bring stores to you um, in the self-driving world where, you're caught, where your store is coming to your home, um, not just the delivery service that's there so that you can choose and select what you want. So the possibilities really are endless as we move to this future. It is also interesting that it could really impact work. Why does our workspace need to be stationary? Why can't it be mobile? Why can't you move your workspace to wherever gives you inspiration and to be collaborating with those that are on the go? So these are autonomous workspaces that are mobile. You can see in this, in this uh, rendition that are, that's here. Another area that we think is gonna have significant impact is around transit. Why not rethink transit? So trains are a very efficient way to move lots of people from point A to point B. And that's because they have a high throughput you could have self-driving pod trains that virtually connect each other, move at very high speeds, and then each one of them can go off like slot cars and do a point-to-point -point trip as well. Very convenient and comfortable inside the cabin. And this is something that was tested in Heathrow uh, a bit ago. In addition to that, let's see. Oh, here we go. We think that the electrification of mobility, as well as the autonomy and self-driving is gonna impact the B2B space too. So whether it's shipping, whether it's last mile delivery with little robots like this one below by dispatch.ai, um, thinking about autonomy around trucks that go long distances and even autonomy in the warehouses like the one at Amazon right there. Uh, it really is spreading and the base technologies are actually here today. Now there's some future technologies that are interesting too, so for example, in this case, you may have seen what Elon Musk is trying to do with the Boring Company. It's a great name. I think it's based in LA. Um, and that one is transporting cars underground to avoid the congestion above. And similar to the train concept, moving them on track so you can get a high throughput. And of course, something of interest to the aerospace community around flying cars. So I'm going to dig into flying cars. I really look at the application as air taxis is a way to think about it more. And uh, it's exciting. There's a lot going on in this space. Just this morning, Joby uh, announced that they're going to go public via SPAC. Joby and Lilium, I think, are the two top contenders who've raised a lot of money in this space. And they think that they're going to be launching in 2024. So not that far away, just a couple years ago. There's still some hurdles on the left here that I mentioned. There's managing the airspace, especially at these low levels, um, noise issues that are there. Even though it's electric, there's still noise uh, from the props. And of course, zoning around takeoff and landing in a very dense urban environment. The technology core is there, but we are still yet to take this to production scale. And there's always trade-offs that have to be made around the battery weight, uh, the range of the vehicle that we're gonna be optimizing over time. And then finally, there's a consumer trust. This is such a new area. Uh, consumers are more nervous about getting into the air than they are staying on the ground, even though the air could be a lot safer. Something we need to get over. 
So uh, the other piece around this is that it's not just about these mobility new products and services, but the ripple effect is going to be massive. And this is exciting for entrepreneurs. It's not just about creating the aircraft or creating the vehicle or, or a subcomponent. It's about the service industries that are going to be disrupted. So when we move away from ownership, the insurance industry, auto loans, used cars, rentals, gas stations, service stations, even getting your driver's license, all of those things have to be uh, retooled. And it represents over a $2 trillion opportunity, even larger than automotive transportation in the United States uh, that's there. It's exciting. So I'm going to end this with where are we today? Because I talked about the future. Well, what's exciting is that today we do have self-driving on Lyft. And this is something I've been working on. You can get a self-driving trip uh, by opening up the app in certain locations right now in Las Vegas uh, and in Chandler, Arizona. And we think that the ride sharing is gonna be the first application of these kind of technologies because one of the challenges that we have in self-driving is that it doesn't work in all conditions in all places. And the consumer just wants a ride. So when they click on a lift, if there's a self-driving car available, we're gonna deliver it. If not, you're gonna get a human. And we think that's gonna exist for a very long time because it's gonna take years and years for the autonomous self-driving technology to get better such that um, it can take any place that a human. So, we think over the next 10 years or so, the growth of the rideshare industry as people move away from car ownership in towards tra uh, transportation as a service. And even if the majority of rides turn out to be self-driving in the next 10 years, you're still gonna need more humans driving uh, in 10 years than we have today. So we really think it's gonna be symbiotic uh, going forward, not just autonomous that's there. I wanna end with this quote that we gave in our S1 filing, which is that, for us, the work here is exciting, not just about uh, the fact that we're building these new products around mobility and that the industry is gonna be creating all sorts of things, especially out of this, this accelerator that's here, but it's also that we're gonna be converting our cities so that they're around people and not cars, where you can coexist pedestrians, bikers, and children. That's really the promising and exciting future. So with that, uh, I hope you enjoyed this, this brief keynote and uh, I'll hand it back over. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Raj. Really appreciate your time. Um, and now we are going to take this and thinking about all of these technological changes that are happening across the industry, um, dive into aerospace and the future of aerospace. Um, Loretta, uh, sorry, I need to share my screen too. Um, uh, Loretta, Mo, Mel, Mark, I invite you all to unmute yourselves and start sharing your video. Come on up to the stage. <laughs> Fantastic. So Elizabeth, you want us to take it away? Yeah, do we have uh Oh, we should, yeah, we've got Mo, we've got Melanie. Yeah, we've got Mo, yeah. Oh, we got Mark's unmuted. That's good. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop screen share so we can see you guys. And Loretta, I'll let you take it from here. Fantastic. I'm so grateful that you guys are able to join you all were able to join us today. Thanks for taking time out of your awesome endeavors. Um, I just wanted to st and start by asking, um, why did you decide to base your aerospace operations in Los Angeles? This is for whoever wants to jump in. One, one or you or all of you, whatever feels moves you. I'm happy to start, uh, Loretta, just because we actually started the company in Seattle five years ago, and I wasn't involved at the time, and then decided to move down to Los Angeles, and really driven by access to the talent and the legacy of aerospace that we've had here, and we are trying to sort of meld the, the new age technology approaches, obviously SpaceX and in our world on, on space specifically is down here, and there's a deep talent pool uh, of folks that are either leaving SpaceX or have left SpaceX. 
uh, but it was a very our founder and two founders were based in Seattle and, and the initial six, nine months of the company were were based up there um, as they were, one of them was an ex borge and person, but but came down here to chase the talent and we have lots of it and it's been a phenomenal choice that we've made and uh, in, in, in the 300 or so strong people we have today. That's great. And, and actually I realized I should take a step back and let each of you give us sort of like the one minute of just you you and your company and what what it is that you're bringing, bringing to our aerospace world today. So why don't we start with you, Melanie? What is Certainly. Slingshot Aerospace? Um, yeah, Slingshot Aerospace is uh, empowering our clients, <clears throat> excuse me, organizations with decision intelligence technologies for space only now. So we recently uh, did a minor pivot and we are singularly focused on the space domain. Um, wow. And what that means is, yeah, it's a very exciting time for us and a lot of excitement within the company. You know, we, we hire people that are uh, passionate about space. And so you can only imagine once we uh, brought that focus in, which is the theme of what I'd like to share with the, the startups today is, is focus. But um, you can only imagine the excitement in the company right now as we are uh, shifting to this singular focus. But um, that's what we do. We, we pull in data from lots of different places, different sources, satellites, ground-based sensors looking up, uh, sensors looking out and beyond uh, on orbit, and then contextual information. We leverage machine learning to extract clarity and, and true information for those that need to make critical decisions in that complex environment, uh, whether it's owner operators or uh, sensor operators or defense operators. That's what That's we great. do. And just for how, how, a sense of how big the company is, like how many employees are Certainly. here. Certainly. We're just short of 40 right now. Um, and we're looking to, to grow that, hopefully double that over the next couple of years. That's great. All right, Mark, tell us a little bit about Skyrise. What, what are you, what's the vision? What do you bring into the world? Yeah, we want to democratize the skies. So a uh, little bit of personal background that led to the company. I grew up in the Midwest. I spent a lot of time sitting inside the car, driving five hours from one state to the next. And I was pretty frustrated with that because I realized the door-to-door -door travel time was the same in the automobile as it was in the gate flying aircraft. Even though the gate flying aircraft only flew for about 45 minutes gate to gate, you have those two massive pieces of infrastructure and then the automobile on both sides. So as a 10-year-old, that's, uh, that's a frustrating realization. And what I, I became convinced of at a fairly young age is that if we can put people on aircraft and fly aircraft today as we drive automobiles, we could completely change the transportation landscape and get a lot more people flying places and having more experiences and connecting with more people. So I founded the company almost five years ago to make that possible. We wanna make it possible for you to be able to get your driver's license and your flyer's license when you're 16 years old and maybe you can't pass the SAT yet. It should be just as possible. Um, it's at, the FAA is actually not uh, uh, a stop to that. It may come as a surprise to a lot of people, but you know you can get a private pilot's license for 40 hours, but I would never recommend getting into an airplane with a 40 hour pilot. Um, it actually takes more time than that uh, on average in order to get into a car and learn how to drive it effectively. In the United States is about 50 hours is, is what most studies show. So what, what we wanna make possible is for you to be able to get into an aircraft like the one that's behind me and with 40 hours of training, be one of the safest pilots in, in the world and be able to do so on a consistent basis. And, I, and hearing a little bit of the, the Lyft presentation prior to this, you know, I think the biggest barriers to things like urban air mobility are, are around pilot shortage. There's only 20,000 helicopter pilots today in the country. Kobe's pilots would have been one of the best in the country. And so there's really only about a thousand. And the second piece is weather, the same weather that plagues the autonomous cars, it's even worse in the sky. If you don't have the ability to fly what's called IFR through the cloud, you're not gonna be able to fly 25% of the time in Los Angeles due to a marine layer, layer and fog. So you gotta unlock those things if you wanna realize urban air mobility and a transportation revolution like the Model T had on the ground. And that's what this company is all about. Fantastic, that's great. Thank you, Mark. And yeah, and then we'll circle back. Mo, relativity space, what's the game? Yeah, so we, we 3D print rockets uh, in, a, in a nutshell. And really the core innovation here is building our own 3D metal printers. And um, our belief is in the next couple of decades, everything that flies can and should be 3D printed. And so uh, the vision is the first 
couple of products. We, we talked about our, our rockets and uh, we can really bring a unique and differentiated approach to aerospace manufacturing. Uh, believe it or, or not, we've been building airplanes for the better part of 50, 60 years and pretty much the same exact way. Uh, even at SpaceX, it's super impressive that a Falcon 9 takes 18 months, but it still takes us 18 months. And most of that cost is labor um, and a lot of fixed tooling. And so we um, at scale will be able to do a rocket from powder or wire, depending on the kind of additive technology we start with and get to a rocket in 60 days. And that's of course cheaper and many other simplified simplified supply chain elements around that has less than a thousand total components but ultimately every 60 days we can also print a better version of that rocket and so the compounding rate of innovation in in aerospace broadly changes changes dramatically and so we'll start with space and we believe we're the second of two companies in the history of the world to to have a publicly declared mission of making life interplanetary and uh, the idea is to take these printers onto Mars and do autonomous manufacturing on another planet, on the moon, in orbit, what, what have you. But there's a trillion dollar aerospace manufacturing industry in the meantime, as well as a launch business to, to be had. So that's the that's the vision. That's fantastic. Everybody loves a bold, audacious vision. That's that's really cool. Yeah, like we're not just okay with 3D printing, you could have been just impressed at 3D printing rockets, but we're gonna go beyond that. We're we're going to go with we're making life interplanetary. Yeah, there you go. Awesome. Thanks, Mo. Um, Melanie, as the youngest company on the panel today, um, we wanted to know what your thoughts are on the aerospace market that we have here. And then in, like investor, like for think of all the people starting out who are tuning in who are like, we want to do what you did. You know, what's the investor appetite feeling like right now for aerospace businesses in LA? You know, what, what's it looking like out there? Yeah, I think it's uh, a thriving market. I think, um, you know, it's not a trillion do dollar market just yet. I think that we've got some, um, you know, some work to do as an ecosystem to get it there. And I think we've got to work together to do that. Um, I'll go back and, and, and just explain a little more as to why we started in LA and, and then let you know what I think about the LA sector here. Um, I was in the Air Force for 21 years and, and throughout my space side of that career, um, I got really close to some of the, the, um, the primes out here, we'll just say. Um, and, and then I moved out here, and this was my final duty station um, and really got to know the industry even more creating next generation advanced concepts um, that are some of which are on orbit today. Um, and I just realized how rich the ecosystem is here. I mean, it started back in the 60s um, in the Apollo program, and it has not stopped. Um, and, and right now, um, the market, I think, is just a phenomenal place to start. And if you are here as a startup in Los Angeles, um, I think uh, you are cultivated by that, right? Those, um, you know, at one point in time, the big guys like Boeing and Northrop and, and L3 Harris and, and those types um, didn't really want to work, work with startups, but they need to now. So the digital transformation that has happened up in Silicon Valley with other industries is just now really starting to pick up in the aerospace industry. And they're looking for agility. They're looking for small companies to come in and help them as, as they try to turn their Titanics into uh, very agile uh, digital first uh, organizations and answer the call to their customers. Um, and so I think right now being in Southern California, it's dotted with with aerospace companies, both large and small. And, um, you know, the the footprint uh, continues to grow. And I just think even even the incubators like Starburst is here. Um, Spaceworks over at the, the Air Force Base is starting to really look towards uh, small companies as well. Um, and there's an opportunity to blend your seed funding, uh, both with government dollars um, and, and VC dollars here in Los Angeles, as a lot of the VCs are even moving down from the valley. So that's what I think about um, the ecosystem down here in Los Angeles. It's an exciting time. Oh, that's cool. Um, I'm just curious if you, any of you have any experience like does it feel like there's a community here too amongst the startups? Like, are there 
social, well, pre-COVID maybe, or digital, were there gatherings? Do you, do you all know each other? Is it like Silicon Beach, you know, where, you know, is, it, is there a community that's forming amongst the startups or is it is it just, you're not even sleeping and eating, so you don't really have time to find out what the others are up to? I'll throw that to Mark since, or yeah, Mo, if you have an insight. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say, I think the short answer for Lisa, and I'm, I'm eight months new to aerospace and eight months new to space. And uh, I, I can't say that there's a community equivalent to what exists in the, you know, let's call it software, e-commerce world or, and the like. And, and I think that's exactly why efforts like scale and getting the community uh, in and around together are so important because it doesn't exist and so to me like the only the only relationships that people come with are yeah we used to work for xyz company together and whether that was up in seattle or down in you know hawthorne like it's that's pretty much the only two that have existed in our industry at scale and and so there's a little bit of that um but nothing beyond that that's formalized and i would love for it to blossom and because you know to, to melanie's point like I having kind of poured into space, like as a new newbie, this is like being in aviation in like the thirties and forties and, and the kinds of things and the innovation and the approaches that are coming, you know, what, what, what Mark's talking about at Skyrise as well. Like there's just going to be so much more innovation. And, and I think SpaceX is dramatically to credit for bringing some of those agile approaches and mindset down into this sort of quote unquote old legacy mentality of, of you know aerospace manufacturing and, and and so I'm super thrilled to see these kinds of things and that's why we're big supporters of, of doing these things in the community. Great thank you so much Mo. All right so Mark um, I know the regulators are out there working trying to figure out how to handle this new era of automated vehicles flying around and aided flight like you're working on um, how do you see the certification battle playing out, you know, for you, for your products and, and what you're doing? Like, how do, how do you get that across the line long-term? Yeah, I think the key is actually to, to not think about it so much as, uh, as a battle, but something more of a partnership with the regulators. And from a technology standpoint, I think we, in, in general, the technology industry often, I think, is clouded vision because of all the experiences with the autonomous car, right? It's a space where, you know, there's been a lot of challenges and there's no definition about what needs to be certified. And so we're, we're facing kind of the dark days of the, the autonomous car movement. But in, in aviation, it's totally different, right? You had the Lockheed 1011 that could go wheels up to wheels down across the Atlantic Ocean with no intervention by the pilot or the co-pilot back in the 70s and 80s. I mean, that's old technology, very old, 30 years plus old, <laughs> uh, right? So the FAA has literally decades of experience certifying systems that highly automate the cockpit. And what you'll notice about our company is we never talk about autonomy uh, unless, you know, somebody labels us as such, but we we're really careful about that because we don't actually believe in autonomy. Uh, if you define it as no human intervention and the unknown unknowns are somehow being managed by the human that by definition is not certifiable, right? You need to find a way to make something provably correct. So if you can make something provably correct on the certification basis that was originated by aircraft like the Lockheed 1011 that had a lot of automation that made it possible to make that flight, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, then there already is a clear path to certification. And then incrementally increasing the levels of automation after that. I mean, we're talking about something that's more akin to ADOS, you know, than an autonomous car. And so uh, fortunate for us, we're, we're actually standing on the, the shoulders of giants. Um, this industry has been moving in this direction for a very long time. I always point out to folks, you know, there's an unmanned aircraft breaking the sound barrier also in that era, you know, a long time ago, that's also old technology. Um, you don't have to, you don't have to, you know, rewrite physics or rewrite the certification basis in order to make this vision that we're talking about possible or even urban air mobility possible. Um, you just need to take a really concerted approach following what the regulators have spent decades, you know, identifying. And you know, I think it's really interesting this morning, waking up, seeing that nacelle uh, from the the Boeing aircraft on a, a Pratt and Whitney turbofan engine, you know, in, in, in the middle of the city, Pratt and Whitney's been building turbofan engines for also about that long, and they know very well how to do it. Um, and it's really challenging. And, you know, what, what, what's interesting about that is one failure results in it being on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, but there's little, literally millions of, of sky miles happening uh, uh, every couple of weeks around the world. So that's how good engineering and automation is in the sky today. 
Um, and we just got to make sure that we're using all the best practices in order to leverage what's already been done to create something that's a little bit different product definition uh, and working lock arm with the regulators. But uh, we, we see them as wind in our sails because they're all about safety. And the fastest path to safety is helping the human be elevated to intent rather than the, the muscle you know, moving the joystick and trying to make the aircraft stable. Not a good place for the human. So we, we hope to take them away from that. Very cool. Love it. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Melanie, um, how you talked about how you've recently pivoted to just all space. So we we're sort of curious, how, how has your strategy changed over the last four years? Um, what were you doing before that? What were some of the other lines that you were pursuing? And, and why did you decide to just do that focus? You said that was your advice to people's focus. Where, where did that come from? Yeah, so we were originally, um, you know, our, our data fabric was looking at extracting insights for both geospatial and space situational awareness. Um, and, you know, there's a sweet spot where that comes together, but it, that Venn diagram, that, that Venn is very uh, small, right? And so um, the geospatial community is very uh, saturated, we'll say. And we were pushing closer and closer to the edge, but as we did, the edge actually goes higher and higher altitude. Right. So, so um, it just it, it just became abundantly clear with the traction that we had on the space side. Um, and as we're bringing that that physical world into the digital so that our clients can can either simulate or manipulate or even just get real time information about their assets. Um, we just decided, hey, you know what, we focus is the key here startups. Um, especially startups that deal with government money can fall into a trap of going after anyone that has an inkling of a um, of curiosity or dollars towards uh, your your vision, and that can end up with different products, right? And different products in an early stage startup doesn't necessarily bode well. Um, but once you start seeing the traction, and once you really um, make hard decisions to you know, start to sanitize, um, life becomes a lot easier. It's a lot better to say no than, than um, yes all the time. And so that is the major shift that we've made and we're happy about it. Boundaries, when you're doing your startup, remember to keep your boundaries. boundaries. Yeah, sharpen okay. that focus. Good work. Um, Mo, um, how do you think you'll be able to fully for 3D print rockets or 4D print them, you know, however? Um, given the difficulties and limitations of like 3D printing tech today, and then uh, follow on, um, is anyone thinking, talking about reusability of your rockets? Yeah, yeah, a great question. So I think one of the interesting things that's dramatically changed over the last five or seven years is um, the advancements in 3D printing tech. And so we, we have our own material science teams and develop custom alloys and this what started five years ago as a effectively a science experiment with 10 people trying to figure out exactly that question. Uh, we feel like the fundamental science pieces were ticked off like three to four years ago. We then sort of had a phase of small water bottle size tank structures and exploding them by design to see where they where they break. And, and now over the last year, we've done them with large scale structures and actually we're in the midst of printing what would be our demo flight at the end of this year. And so it's a, it's the flight articles. Um, and you know, you're never, when you're dealing with a rocket, even though it's a solved problem or still a very difficult problem, um, never, never say we're in the bright, but we feel like all the, you know, quote unquote fundamental science risk has been retired and everything from this point on, or certainly in the last six months, even is a normal rocket problem and, and beyond and incredible complexity, bringing it all together as, as you're aware, Loretta. So, um, so I think we, we feel very comfortable that if, um, you know, we can deal with the heat and resistance or pressure properties that a rocket needs so we can do other aerospace uh, products. Oddly enough, rockets is a great place to start, right? And people ask us this question of, will you 3D print cars, for example? And again, never say never, but the answer is probably not because a 4,000 pound rocket and a 4,000 pound car cost about the same to make. And the dollar per pound on a rocket is much more significant than a car. And so that's how we 
think about the end markets we'll go after and the orders we go into. And then there's a regulatory framework that Mark was talking about clearly, you know, dealing with uh, crude missions or transporting humans is a very different uh, approach. But we feel we feel pretty pretty good about that stuff being retired. And 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 I'm sorry, the second part of your question was reusability. Reusability, yes. So uh, we're not fully ready to talk about that quite yet, but I'll sort of preview this group. Like there may be teasers on that sooner rather than later on our thinking and approach on the second product and why and what that means. And, and so we don't view those as as different or separate. It, our belief is on the size rockets, our first product is a 1250 kilogram to Leo product. And the economics don't make sense to push for reusability, at least the way things stand today. That could look different in a different vehicle size, potentially. So I'll leave it at that. That's really exciting. I love it. So, so agile, um, all this innovation is great. Um, Mark, what are some of the things that you're, you predict or are excited about seeing happen in the aviation industry over the next 10 years? And, and, and also a timeline for your product, you know, is it, are there people, private pilots using it now? When can I start flying? What's happening? Yeah, so I think I think something really interesting has happened over the last couple of weeks with uh, with SPACs. Uh, you know, we've seen I think it's north of a couple billion dollars now pumped into companies that are creating fundamentally new air vehicle platforms. And what's you know the biggest takeaway from that is there's an awful lot of money that's being funneled into R and D for new flying machines, and that's awesome doesn't really matter what the outcome is. Uh, you know, it's going to be a lot of innovation that's going to happen in this industry that in many ways is kind of stuck in World War II. Um, so I think that's just fantastic. Um, we're going to see kind of a renaissance for general aviation or whatever you want to call the market as it evolves with new platforms and our technology coming online. So I couldn't be more excited about that. Um, as far as our timeline, we're talking about months uh, to certification, not years. So we're, we're pretty excited. Um, and the level of functionality is, is, is pretty significant. So uh, there's a lot of excitement going on with our team right now. We're in the process of hiring over 100 engineers over the next 12 to 16 months. So we've got a lot of stuff going on. Wow. I've, I know how hard it is to run a startup and make payroll and just try to convince the share your vision over and over again with investors in the world. I just, I just wanted to stop and just acknowledge each of you for just what you're doing and, uh, and being in the unknown, you know, it's not security and, uh, you know, you're, you're on the cutting edge and, and blazing a new trail for all of us. So I'm, I'm, thank you for that too. Um, Melanie, I, was, I wanted to know um, what other advice you might have for um, aerospace startups that are trying to get into this game. What, what have you, what are, what are your hard earned uh, lessons? There's a lot, there's so many. We talked about focus a little bit. Um, I think it's it's important to um, you know think about your hiring process from the very very beginning. And in a in a frontier tech ecosystem, you need top tier uh, from the very beginning if you can. Um, and so um, making sure that 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 is in place, making sure that you address culture from the very beginning, because a lot of times you might have top tier. But uh, you know they don't act very nice, or you know they don't get <laughs> along with other people. Um, they don't work well in teams, and so uh, addressing culture and what you want your your company to be early on with your co-founders or yourself if you're a single founder um, is so important. Culture will set itself if you don't set it if if you mm. don't start to put put those boundaries for your canvas in place. It will it will set itself and it will not be what you want it to be guaranteed. Um, so those two things. And then um, in this frontier tech world, um, although I warned about what can happen when you're leveraging government money, if you do it wisely and um, set a business model um, around early government R&D funding uh, to find those competitive advantages simultaneously to growing your public and private revenue streams, it can be very powerful if, if you have the right folks on the team to, to um, you know, make sure you're, it's curtailed in a, in a way that's most beneficial for, for your business. Um, 
And so just don't discount the government because of the long cell cycles and bureaucratic systems, but be cautious. Um, and, and with that also, whether you're on the public side, the commercial side or the, um, or the, the government side, this ecosystem comes with some legacy um, and, and respect it um, and, and help you know, leapfrog that legacy forward. It's beautiful. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, Mo, um, Mark was talking about all the activity we've seen lately and the SPACs. And uh, we know in your sector, launch sector, um, you know, there's a lot of competition. You know, there's people tracking like the lists of space launch, comp for, you know, companies trying to get get in, get in on it. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And, and, um, and why do you think relativity um, really has a, an advantage? Yeah, um, so definitely competition is fierce on the launch side. You know, I'll 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 say we are, have been privileged to get the investor interest at the levels that we did a few months ago. Uh, really, kind of I think ultimately driven by the the idea that if you think about sort of privatization 1.0 in space and largely driven by SpaceX, reusable rockets were hands down the best thing that happened in space in 50 years perhaps since the the land the moon landing and and so to me that's great but what needs to change for us in the next decade or two is really manufacturing approach and we think about 3d printing as automation for aerospace for space and, and rockets and so that's where we'd like to believe our approach is fundamentally different and so if we were to announce a second vehicle, it is not a five-year path to building that vehicle. And for anybody that's ever built a rocket, as you know, like no matter what you do, like a second vehicle, even a, a what's called a block upgrade uh, on an existing vehicle is effectively like starting from scratch. And so our existing tooling, our existing printers can print larger rockets. Um, for sure, and that, and the way we built it, and the architect, the designs, because they were never built for fixed tooling, are scalable one for one. Avionics is scalable, and so there are that. That to us is the biggest differentiator. Is you know who's to sort of say how the CubeSat market or the medium-sized payload market, or is Starship going to take everything that ever needs to go up to space? Like we'll we'll see how all that evolves, but we can flex much faster than perhaps some of the other players in the market and I'll sort of gently, you know, gently leave it at that. I, I will say, you know, in the last even six months, there has been a dramatic, dramatic, dramatic increase in, at least on the institutional investor side of the space market. And so even when we first made an out call on, on the financing we did on our Series D, there, there was just kind of like, well, why do people take things up to space? Like, I don't even know what it is to the kinds of questions we're getting now or the knocks on doors are coming in a very sophisticated way to say, well, we have a view on XYZ company that's announced this or that, and we love it, or what's your position on that? And it's a, it's very different than the tone from six months ago. So, you know, back to your question on advice, like I assume that there's a number of students on, on here or people aspiring to be in the sector. I actually have this deep, deep belief that we should all get ready and for, for, for Mel and for Mark, like there, there's about to be a deep talent war in the next couple of years, which of course mm. is great for, for folks studying and folks that are in the industry because propulsion people are just as skilled and just as unique, but there used to be like four companies that needed their services. And I think propulsion is gonna look like software very quickly here in the next you know, year or two or three. And that's true of many other aerospace skills and so, for all those, you know, studying engineering, uh, please stick to it and and don't let your comp sci friends, you know, take you <laughs> take you another direction. That would be my my advice. Oh, that's great! I love it, Mo. That's such a, you know, in this world of like, oh, I don't know if I can get a job when I graduate. All oh, the economy, like, it's neat to hear like, oh my God, we're gonna need like so many propulsion engineers. I hope there's enough of them. There are jobs out there. That's that's fabulous. Um. Mark, do you have anything to say for any entrepreneurs who might be listening about operating in, in this like tightly uh, regulated space like you were talking about, like when you have these products that you have to deal with the regulators and how you, how you, how you manage that? Yeah, I think it's, it's all about uh, having a really good working relationship with them and understanding what their needs are before you embark 
Um, so, you know, there's a lot of prior art that you can look through and say, what's the closest thing to what you're, you're looking at that perhaps has been certified before and what's been the FAA, in our case, it's the FAA's position on, on such a vehicle or such a thing. And you can look at that and then you can figure out what, what had to take place and what level of reliability and, and certification type that they pursued. And then on the back of that, start to form a plan and work with the regulator to figure out that plan. Um, it's, it's funny, I get asked this question a lot about certification and, you know, barriers to, to launching the product and, you know, is the FAA somehow a roadblock? We don't see it that way at all. We actually see the FAA as a working partner. We think it's, it's positive. It's good. It's another level of design review that helps make sure that we're <laughs> dotting the I's and crossing our T's really. Uh, we, we think it's a positive thing. I'd say it's, it's, it's more challenging actually to be working with hardware that's safety critical that has humans in it. So, you know, if you compare what we're working on to a lot of other companies, if your car rolling on the ground and you're building something up, you know, that's highly automated, you press a button and pull over to the side of the road. Um, you know, if you're launching rockets, they're for the most part unmanned. And if they explode, you know, a couple times out of 10, that's okay. And that's awesome because you get to move really fast. For us, when we're flight testing, all of our flight tests have Human on board, humans on board. So, you know, the margin for error is much lower. And that means every time we go to flight test, the level of rigor that we have to assume is, is, is pretty dramatic. So um, that that's much more challenging than dealing with regulators because actually in all cases, we're exceeding what they require from a reliability standpoint. It's all about how do you move fast inside a space where you want to be really conscious about all the risks that you're taking so as to preserve, you know, the, the risk tolerance that, that you assume for yourself and keep people safe. That, that's the hard part. And going back to your question, you know, if you if you want to start a company in, in aerospace, um, you know, I, I, at least inside this atmosphere, you know, is what we're working on here at Skyrise. It's going to take a tremendous amount of resilience. You know, if you go to Silicon Valley, which is actually where Skyrise was founded, and I moved the company here two years ago for a lot of the reasons that folks already mentioned. Um, you know, you you compare the number of hardware companies to software companies, most of those companies are software companies and they, they build apps or they build some type of SaaS, you know, uh, technology. It's great and a big opportunity, but, you know, there's, there's jokes, hardware is called hardware, you know, for, for good reason. And, and if you're, if your hardware is safety critical and, and moving people, you know, it's layers on top of that. So if you do want to embark on something in, in aerospace and it comes with that additional level of rigor, be sure that's what you want because it's, it's a lot harder um, than a conventional startup. And so you have all the challenges that a startup brings. Like I love Melanie's point about culture. I completely believe in that. Um, and then on top of that, you have all the other challenges that come with the space that you're playing in. So um, be, be sure you know what you're getting into. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. Yeah, I know similarly with the Virgin, with Virgin Galactic, whenever we do, you know, you could, I'll just stick to our story. Uh, you know, when we do our test flights, we always have a human on board as well, our test pilots. And so, yeah, it's the the stress ratchets up. You know, it's not just an unpiloted test. It's There's always a family on the other side that you better think about. So thank you. Um, Melanie, so Mo alluded to like this upcoming like demand for all hiring and all these people and there's all this in the ecosystem. Um, how have you found the, the search for talent? You said you need to double the size of your organization. You know, it, how hard is it for you to find that, that top tier talent? And what, well, it's what, not what easy. And some of these, what, what's that? I said, what are some tips? How can we do it too? Well, I tell you what, I, you know, you know, going out and searching on LinkedIn is not it for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not it. Um, we ended up hiring um, Silicon Beach talent. So Marissa Peretz was a um, was a mentor throughout our TechStars uh, time. So we um, started out as a TechStars company, not in a cohort, but the the I guess kind of the original. Uh, well, we were the original LA um, TechStars class. But she came in and she was revolutionary in other companies that we had seen grow. She was, you know, the first. Um, team in to build out Tesla. Uh, so she's actually on our advisory board now. And, uh, and, we, and also, um, you know, our, our main, I don't want to call her a recruiter because it's much more than that. The way she goes about, you know, hiring the talent and, and getting us all, you know, aligned prior to that hire um, and then the process of hiring that person. Now, um, it, it's a higher slow environment for us, right? We originally hired fast, uh, fired slow, and we flipped mm -hmm. that on its head over the last year. 
Um, and she's helped, she's been transformational uh, with that. But the talent is hard to find. Um, and we're even taking a little bit different approach. So we're, we're bringing on uh, folks that understand astro and computer science or one or the other, but we train them the other way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, we think that you need to understand both to be successful in, in uh, you know, next generation digital twins for the space environment, for example, right? It's, it's a blend of, of talent. But another critical area here is um, a lot of this, when you're dealing with the government, one has to be US citizens because of ITAR and EAR reasons. And two, a lot of times needs a clearance, right? Um, as your contracts grow, they kind of grow into a different world. Um, and so it just makes it, it complicates it further. But the, the, if, if you can develop 99% of your technology in the unclassified world and not have to deal with that part of it, uh, awesome. You, you've got a bigger pool of talent. Hope that helped. No, that's really cool. I can, Laura, just add, just add to that on the, on the you know, employee and hiring side. Like, I, I think it's... It, consistent with what, what Mark and Mel have said, like it's, it's hard and it's gonna get harder based on what I can see and tell from, from a pulse. The one thing that, you know, I think this is a, it's a virtuous cycle of making sure that you've got the right technology that you can articulate, that you're getting enough commercial momentum and that, that you're hiring the right technical talent. And those three things need to like move together and they actually feed off of each other. And so, I'd like to believe I'm a reasonable storyteller in my life and like storytelling, whether it's with employees or on the commercial front or then in the investor front, like capital, I guess, is the fourth piece of that, like all just needs to work together and they feed off of each other. And like momentum is a real thing in businesses like ours where hardware and you, we know we, we're going to need hundreds of millions of dollars of capital in the coming years. And so you've got to kind of play that storytelling with employees on the front line, with investors, with customers or potential customers, and even to Mel's point with the government and getting infrastructure in our case is also equally important. So all of it goes hand in hand uh, together and feed, feeds off of each other. Beautiful. I like that, Mo. And one other thing there is like talking about that culture and um, it all leads to magnetism. And that, that's what, you know, will differentiate you from the other competitors out there is creating magnetism towards your company. And in order to do that, there has to be a just cause, a bigger cause that you're after, right? Ours is space sustainability. Um, you know, I just encourage everyone to have that big just cause, that big vision, because um, everyone wants to make a difference in the world today. And that will also help with hiring for sure. Beautiful. Okay, so we have just like three minutes left in our panel. So I just wanted to open it up to each of you to share, you know, your one minute closing remarks, you know, what else you would you want to share about your journey or advice you have or anything you want to do? We'll, we'll start with Mark. Yeah, I think, um, you know, spend spend a lot of time, I think I already mentioned this, but spending a lot of time really thinking about what what you are most passionate about. And this kind of goes off of Melanie's point, you know, you, you you only get one shot at life and dedicating your time and your energy to what you're most passionate about is going to lead to the most success for you and the team that you're a part of. So that's really important. And if you're thinking about starting a company, probably want to start a company at the thing that you're, you're most passionate about. It's going to be um, much more powerful. If, if you're doing that, you're going to see much more success. Um, I would just say we're hiring. So if folks are interested, we've got, we've got a little bit different, uh, types of resumes that we're looking for instead of propulsion, obviously it's more on the controls and, you know, things that have to do with vehicle automation, um, don't have to be us citizens and, and, uh, hiring over a hundred folks over the next year. So we've got wow. a lot of rules. Congratulations. That's fantastic. Thanks. We're very excited. Cool. Mo. Yeah, I, I, I think Mark put it really well. I'll, I'll also just put a plug in. We've got something like 120 racks open, plans are to hire several hundred people this year if we can physically make that happen. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree. Like, I, I you know, I, I'm super jazzed about efforts like this and continue to be because innovation and change is never easy and it requires, you know, grit. And, and Mark made the comment of persistence and patience. and. In businesses like this, where you're taking 
um, let's say, sort of legacy mindsets and traditional approaches and very, um, you know, regulated, but also connected. And there's politics and like you're dealing with entities that have, you know, government relationships for decades. And it's non-trivial. It's not like building the next consumer app. And I come from a consumer world where, where it's much easier and, and to break through. So just keep the grit and, and let yourself get uncomfortable as you, you know, whether you've got a startup or you're a student and it will require patience. And it's just, this is the sort of gold rush era in aerospace. So I like to believe that in the next couple of decades, because finally that industry is adopting what's happened in technology, you know, broadly over the last 20 years. So it's a super exciting time to be in the, in the sector and, um, but, but will require still some patience because magic won't happen in the next two or three years, but certainly over the next decade or two. Yeah, perfect. Melanie. Yeah, what they said, um, Mark and Mo, and, and then I'll just end with like, people are greater than everything. And that's your customers and your team. People are greater than everything. If you keep that even ahead of your technology, um, I think that your technology will grow leaps and bounds beyond what you could even envision. Um, and, you know, in this ecosystem, your customers need to like you and then they need to trust you. And those are two variables that, that can't be broken if you want to succeed in this industry. Mm. Beautiful. That's, yeah, beautiful. Um, thank you so much for your time. I'll just close. I'm with the letting, letting everyone on the call know that um, I'm the co-creator of Yuri's Night, the World Space Party. Uh, we usually in non-COVID times do a big event under the shuttle here in LA, which is a great opportunity to meet people, meet co-founders, meet future hires, meet investors. Um, and you know, this year we're doing it uh, all online, but we'll there'll still be a little Zoom potential to meet people um, in the backstage pass. And uh, yeah, it'll be Saturday, April 10th. Uh, we've got you know, Richard Branson, Richard Garriott, um, you know, uh, Italian astronaut Luca Parmitano, OK Go is going to be premiering one of their videos there. We, we bring art and science together and, and we're all about the people. So um, thanks for having me on, Elizabeth. Thank you all for your time. And um, thanks everyone for listening. Thank you, Loretta. Thank you, Loretta. And thank you, Mel, Mo, Mark, <laughs> for being on the panel. It was really great to hear from you all. All right, I will have you guys all turn off video. Um, and I am going to hand things over at this point to my colleague and the co-founder of Starburst, Van Esplodi. Thank you, Elizabeth. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. So uh, thank you again for that incredible panel. Uh, thank you, Loretta, Melanie, Mo, and Mark for sharing your incredible insights and experience and what it takes to build a successful aerospace business and the benefits um, to scaling your business here in Southern California. Uh, I wanna welcome everyone to this launch event for scale powered by Starburst and UCLA. Even though UCLA is our key partner in this initiative, we are working with a much larger node of universities uh, all the way through uh, to Northern California uh, and the Bay Area through to the East Coast. We have the support and partnership with UCLA's Samueli School of Engineering as well as the Anderson School of Management and the Technology Development Group. Uh, and we are really excited to, to kick off this program. My name, as Elizabeth said, is Van Espobodi. I am the co-founder and managing partner of Starburst. My day-to-day -day is managing our operations here in the US. I spend most of my time uh, advising government agencies, including the recently established US Space Force, US Air Force, NASA, as well as most of the major primes we all know from your Northrops uh, to your Raytheons and Lockheeds. After almost 20 years, my belief is solidified that entrepreneurs uh, like Relativity, Skyrise, and Slingshot, as well as Virgin Galactic, who's been a champion for a while now, has, are backed by a rising tide of capital that have become the most capable of changing the way innovation happens in our sector. So we did hear a lot about the why now on during the panel, uh, especially the recent uh, trend of SPACs uh, intersecting the aerospace industry um, and why these companies choose LA as their home. Uh, I will remind everyone some of the news that we've had in just this month alone, um, where in addition to Momentus, uh, Astra, 
Archer, Joby, Black Sky, Lilium. We're expecting even more specs. Um, thanks to the companies like SpaceX, uh, as Mo had mentioned, that are approaching almost 20 years old of age, still private with a market valuation of about $74 billion. We're seeing even more investors and the public market showing incredible interest in aerospace. Uh, Virgin Galactic, whose sister company Virgin Orbit had their first successful launch from a 747, has today a market cap of over $11 billion. This continues to open the floodgates for entrepreneurs raising capital, setting investment records even after the pandemic uh, uh, in the last year alone. And we are all part of this new economy that's championed by uh, incredible innovators and startups developing small satellite technology, uh, 3D printed rocket engines, space traffic management, hypersonic spacecraft, artificial intelligence, uh, quantum sensors, and so much more. At Starburst, we estimate thousands of new companies coming to life each year in the field of aviation, space, and defense, and it's continuing to grow. So ask yourself, where was SpaceX 15 years ago? Here at Scale, this is a one-of-a-kind initiative uh, backed by the federal government, together with players um, of industry, uh, government, academia, and the investment community to make, to continue to reinforce LA as an aerospace capital of the world, to accelerate aerospace startups and support technology and economic development across Los Angeles. You've heard it from Congressman Liu, you heard it from uh, State Senator Ben Allen today, and we continue to hear it uh, across uh, um, all of the network that we continue to, to, to work with. We are combining the best of Accelerator curriculum plus the Starburst Global Network for one-on-ones with potential customers and investors. Los Angeles, over the last decade, continues to evolve in reflecting what is its own economic engine and how the venture community will tap into that. Uh, LA was defined as an app-only capital. Today is considered the fastest growing tech hub in the country. LA has a very interesting mix of talent, capital, accelerators, diverse market, warm weather, and a good surf that is hard to beat and draws entrepreneurs from all over the world. We have surpassed New York in total investments in 2020, second only to the Bay Area. Uh, we've seen over 794 deals uh, totaled over the last year and more and more continuing to revisit what it means to invest in hardware or the uh, interaction of, of digitizing uh, the manufacturing process. Uh, we've seen an average 38.9% increase in deal flow uh, in Los Angeles and investors are continuing to focus on bigger and bigger deals. So with that, I'm, I'm grateful uh, and, and for Elizabeth and the rest of the team in, in uh, moderating today's discussion. And we, uh, coming up, have an, in, uh, a, an incredible mix of uh, three presentations um, that will de continue to demonstrate what aerospace means, not just in terms of mobility, but really cutting edge technology and where those opportunities are to continue to help early stage businesses scale and grow, not just in Southern California, but around the world. Please remember to register uh, to become a mentor on our website, scalearrow.la. I'll let Elizabeth double check that. Um, and uh, want to hand it back now to Elizabeth and Adam to take it from here. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Van. So yeah, we're going to hear now from three startups. We're gonna hear from Norris Tai, who's worked founder of Exasonic. Exasonic is developing the world's first quiet supersonic airliner. Uh, working on a UAV is their first short-term low boom product demonstration. Uh, Justin, the next we'll hear from Justin Fischetti and Austin Briggs from Inversion Space. Uh, Inversion Space is focused on reducing the cost and increasing the frequency of returning from space. Uh, and then we will turn it over after that to Charlie Welch uh, from ZapBat. ZapBat is a battery AI and hardware company that is revolutionizing how businesses and consumers interact with their battery powered products. Um, a reminder for everyone, there will be some time for Q&A within these talks. So remember to drop your questions in the QA above. Uh, and my colleague, Adam, will kindly be helping uh, ask those questions of the companies. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Norris to start. Norris, if you want to turn on your your mic and video, I will stop presenting and get this. Elizabeth, thanks. Let me just get my screen sharing uh, set up. 
and get going. But again, thank you for this opportunity to present to the LA community. It's great to be back in Los Angeles to spend some time in the Bay Area. Uh, and after I graduated and worked in the industry down here. So, great. Does everyone see my screen? Is it all working? I assume so. <clears throat> great, so hi everyone, my name is Norse T and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Exosonic and our vision is to take you around the world faster using low boom supersonic uh, flights. And so what we're developing is a low boom supersonic airliner that uses aerodynamic shaping techniques to turn the once thunderous clap of a boom and turn it into a soft thump on the ground. That way we can fly supersonic everywhere. And our aircraft cruises about Mach 1.8, carries 50 to 70 passengers over a range of 5,000 nautical miles. And we expect to enter service in the mid 2030s timeframe. And this aircraft really solves the pain point of long flights. With our aircraft, we can then cut everyone's flight times in half, saving millions of people's uh, time and lives so that they can spend more time at the destination versus an aircraft cabin. Now, we understand that developing a supersonic airliner is a monumental task. And so we're breaking it down into a stepping stones approach. As Elizabeth mentioned, we're developing a supersonic UAV first, and that serves two purposes. One, so that we can prove our low boom technology in a cost-effective platform, in addition to potentially selling it to the Air Force and other commercial companies for a variety of purposes that I'll share next. Then after that, we'll do a medium-sized aircraft, like a piloted demonstrator, to prove out further more of the technology in a more uh, similar platform to the supersonic airliner, in addition to get covering some of the regulations required to certify a commercial aircraft. And then finally, the large supersonic airliner to enter service again in the mid 2030s timeframe. Now for the supersonic UAV, uh, we spent some time identifying some use cases and challenges that the Air Force could have with this capability. And as far as we're aware, there are no supersonic UAVs currently uh, being used by the Air Force. So there's one use case of two. One of them is testing new supersonic flight software safely. So currently today, uh, aircraft are integrated with flight software into supersonic platforms like the T-38 that you see here. And then these pilots are putting, you know, since their lives at risk to test these new capabilities and to allow uh, for the software to be pushed at its greatest envelopes, uh, it may be a little bit difficult since you don't want to put the pilot's life at risk. So you need to take a more measured approach. Now, the second application is supersonic manned unmanned teaming operations. And you can imagine a scenario where an F-35 is going into the battlefield and is accompanied with uh, several loyal wingman UAVs. And these UAVs can go ahead in the field of battle and collect information from the battlefield or identify enemy defenses and share that information back to the F-35 pilots, or in fact, potentially even take out those enemy defenses so the F-35s can go in and focus on other uh, targets instead. And these both, in both of these challenges, we believe that a supersonic UAV can be pretty valuable to meeting these needs. And so over here are the two concepts that we've laid out that we are looking to work with the Air Force on. And so there's the base case, which is the test bed that addresses that supersonic flight software use case, where you can install the software into our UAV and then go push the envelope on the software without having the fear of losing a pilot's life uh, while testing the new software. And we expect this aircraft to enter service around the 2024 timeframe. Then a derivative larger version of the UAV, which is in this case for penetrating ISR, could serve that supersonic manned unmanned teaming operation, like I mentioned earlier with the F-35. In this case, this aircraft can go in with some sensors, a ray dome, or even these high power microwave emitter such that they can identify these targets, enemy defenses, and potentially even take them out. And because it's larger and it would be a derivative, we expect a later first flight in the 2026 timeframe. Now our team has deep supersonic experience as well. I used to work on a low boom supersonic flight demonstrator at Skunk Works. And then afterwards I went to business school to start the company. And in fact, I actually got my undergraduate degree in aerospace engineering from UCLA. Then there's Tim McDonald, our CTO and co-founder, and he's had also lived in Los Angeles, having spent his undergraduate career at Caltech, not too far away. 
and then went to Stanford to pursue his PhD, where he established a number of conceptual aircraft design tools that we even still use today. Then there's Bob Sandusky, our chief engineer, and he's really impressive in the industry, having already brought to flight test two Mach 2 supersonic fighters. And in addition to us, we have a team of five full-time employees and four part-time senior consultants. Now to address the market size, we believe that the large UAV market is a beachhead to the much larger airliner market for the supersonic airliner. And from what we've seen uh, from reports out there, the large UAV market can be two to $3 billion per year. And we believe that the UAV sales can reach 20 to 25 UAVs per year or roughly 100, $125 in annual revenue. And the great thing is that there's actually a green field in this UAV space where we're the only ones developing a supersonic UAV that is at least publicly known. And a bunch of other competitors are working on subsonic UAVs. So there's certainly interest in this. We also already have traction for our supersonic airliner. I received $1.4 million in Air Force contracts with the Presidential Executive Airlift Directorate being our largest uh, customer where we're developing an executive transport version of our airliner. And we have secured commercial interest uh, from a major international airliner. Now, in terms of the next steps, we started out with the airliner design, and now we're going to complete that Q2 of Q3 this year, and then revamp our engineering efforts on the UAV. <clears throat> and then some of those efforts would be include, of course, digital engineering and doing some wind tunnel tests. Now, if you'd like to join us on our journey to bring supersonic travel everywhere, we're on all the social media platforms uh, <clears throat> that you see here. And if you're interested in working with us, we have a number of careers opportunities on our webpage that you can check out. Uh, and if you don't see a fit, there's of course the other opportunities where you can drop your resume and we can take a look at it. And if you are uh, interested in partnering with us, uh, please contact me at norris at exosonic.com and we'd love to learn how we can work together. Thanks. Hi Norris, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I love hearing about uh, supersonic technology. I was wondering if you could go over a, a few things, uh, some background information. Um, what is the um, story for supersonic and why is the time that uh, we're developing these supersonic uh, uh, airliners when we had the Concorde way back in the day? Yeah, so I spent a lot of my, my academic and professional experience trying to figure out ways to transport people around the world faster. And that's why I studied aerospace engineering, specifically in propulsion, and worked at a number of companies as a propulsion engineer. And what really led me to believe supersonic, low boom supersonics to be the future is that it just made sense. If you can fly supersonic over land by meeting the sonic boom, then, then yeah, why wouldn't we do that as the next step towards faster commercial aviation or just faster flight in general? Because we've already had supersonic aircraft for 60 years. And the only problem is really muting the sonic boom. And once we have that technical hurdle passed, then let's go for it. And, and that's really what I saw after working on the X-89 program at Skunk Works. I'd like to learn a little, a little bit more about what the problem of quiet supersonic flight is. Is the loudness of the boom really a driving economic factor for a lot of people? Yeah, so right now there's a, a flat out speed limit ban for Mach 1 and above flight. So in fact, you can't fly supersonic over land. Uh, but the thing is, NASA, the FAA, and other international uh, regulators are working on setting low boom or basically changing the speed limit to a noise limit. And so if you can have this low boom flight capability, then you can meet that, uh, well, be lower than the maximum threshold for noise and be able to fly supersonic over land. And that will bring great economic in addition to just practical convenience to people so we can fly, say, coast to coast, which has never been done before for uh, civilians. Excuse me. We have a question coming in for the audience uh, mm -hmm. regarding uh, environmental uh, backlash from your business plan. Yes. What are the environmental and uh, environmental factors that you're uh, bringing into your business plan? For sure. So. Sustainability is huge, not only for supersonic aviation, but aviation in general. And especially for long haul flights, which are generally six to 12 hour flights, there's 
not a really good technical solution. Like you can't really use hybrid electricity or hybrid or just pure electric airplanes or even hydrogen airplanes. So we're looking into alternative fuels that can be carbon neutral. And we've been developing relationships with uh, basically more sustainable aviation fuel providers that we would install into our aircraft. Very nice. Um, you're planning on getting the, uh, uh, the airliner in 2030 and deploying that in 2030. And nine years is a very long time for a startup to survive. And in the right. near term, you're looking to capitalize with uh, supersonic UAVs. Mm -hmm. And as you said, in the, as you mentioned, at least with your competitors, um, none of them are making supersonic drones. Now, these are very smart people at you know, very, very wise institutions in the United States. What is the trade-offs that you've decided to make with your supersonic UAV that they have not decided to make? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's a progression that occurs with technology in the Air Force. And to develop a UAV in general, you want to start with a subsonic UAV because it's just simply simpler, right? But I think generally the next step would be a supersonic UAV. So we're kind of jumping the gun here because it meets our technology demonstration purposes while providing a valuable service to the Air Force. Very good. And the last question from the audience is, um, if you could go over some of the things that differentiates your company from others, uh, your, your mm -hmm. technology and your market position from others like Arion and Boom. Yeah, so we're the only ones that can fly supersonic at the si supersonic overland at the size that we do, right? So. Boom is only doing over water and they've been very public about that. And Ariane is trying to do this thing called mock cutoff where they fly slow enough that the boom does not reach the ground. And there's a number of you know, potential issues that occurs with that technology. And it's also much slower. They're flying at Mach 1.1 whereas we cruise at Mach 1.8 with the low boom. And that's really how we set ourselves apart from other competitors out there. Very good. I love the unbridling of the, of the speed limit. Thank you so much, Norman. <laughs> yep, no problem. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Norris, so much. I'll let you mute yourself now. Uh, Justin and Austin, uh, if you guys want to come to the stage, so to speak. <laughs> Perfect. How is everybody? Beautiful. Get my uh, screen shared right here. Awesome, we should be all set with that there. Cool, awesome. So um, we are in version space and we're focused on low cost return from space. Um, uh, low cost getting to space is solved, so let's figure out how to get back. So Austin and I have kind of known each other for about four years now, um, working on a bunch of technical projects together. Um, we kind of have like a different view on space. We've kind of been thinking about launch a lot. We've been thinking about what the next future is. Um, and we're really, really excited to keep moving forward on that. So we believe that human connectivity and human innovation is driven by being able to access each other, right? And the current problem is there's no good way to get back from space, right? We've solved getting to space for a low cost, but unfortunately there's no real great way to bring mass back down. So that's kind of the problem we're looking at. And now with launch costs at an all-time low uh, and only dropping now with all of the, uh, all the new rockets coming online, it's really a great time to start looking at the next leg of the journey um, for, uh, for space and the economy there. So there's kind of three main problems we're trying to address right now. At about $200 million per launch, it's just drastically too expensive for customers to get back from space if they want their own dedicated mission. Um, as well as it's incredibly low frequency. So there are a lot of applications that you wanna be able to go to space and get back within, uh, within about two weeks. And right now there's only about three returns per year, most of them tied to the International Space Station. And you're looking at about three to four months between them, as well as it's difficult to scale. We all know space infrastructure is generally super expensive and it's really hard to get a billion dollars of capital up front to make your own space station. Um, so we kind of address all of these three problems. So our solution is a small reusable space capsule that costs less than a Porsche 911 to make. Um, it's about four feet in diameter, which allows us to fit on rideshare missions or small launch missions for the cheapest cost uh, to space or the most flexible to space. Customers would integrate their payloads um, for manufacturing, uh, research, or uh, delivery into our capsule on the ground. We'd launch orbit as long as they need and then return back to Earth. 
they get the payload, we get the capsule back, reuse it. So one of our things we're focused on is going small. Um, and going small allows for a lot of really great innovations that hasn't been really seen in the aerospace industry, especially the space industry. Um, hardware is just generally cheaper, right? You don't need these custom valves that are, you know, have 12 week lead times and are uh, $30,000 per valve, right? You can buy COTS parts as well as test faster because of that, right? You can build your test stands quicker. Um, your costs are actually lower for testing. Your hardware, your testing is look cheaper. So you're okay if you mess some stuff up. Actually lets you go quicker. Um, and infrastructure is a massive difference, right? You don't need these massive, massive warehouses where there's all of this uh, manufacturing equipment and stuff. Um, we're actually able to manufacture our capsule inside of a two stall garage. Um, that's the amount of space we need for all, for all of the equipment. <laughs> now we won't be doing that for efficiency reasons, but it's really interesting like the difference in magnitude. Some of the awesome benefits um, that customers can see with this low cost, high frequency return um, is, uh, is really numerous, right? Scalability is a huge one that I like to talk about. It's as if you had, um, so like customers will no longer have to have the equivalent of like a server rack in their uh, office. They can use AWS, right? A similar concept where they can scale their business up as big or as small as they want by using more capsules or less capsules. There isn't this massive upfront cost that they have to predict and grow into, um, as well as flexibility, right? You can launch on any rocket um, and be able to re-enter whenever you want ranging from one day to staying up there for all, all the way up to two years. Um, and responsiveness, right? Within 30 minutes, you can uh, deorbit wherever you want on Earth, within regulatory regions, obviously. So some markets that are gonna change the world. This is what I'm really excited about. So you have global delivery. Um, with a, with a uh, By going to space to come back down to Earth, you can actually um, shorten the timelines and cheapen the cost for a bunch of things. One of the things I love is uh, Antarctica delivery. You can only access Antarctica um, traditionally once a year because of all the weather, but we just punch right through the atmosphere and can deliver equipment, supplies, all sorts of stuff year round, which has a lot of value, um, as well as the defense deployments, right? So by having a constellation of these capsules, you're able to uh, deliver assets and uh, supplies anywhere on earth within 30 minutes. That's a really exciting prospect for the logistics of the military. Um, as well as the boom that we've, we're seeing in the manufacturing industry in space, from fiber optic cable to uh, artificial organs and the discovery of new drugs. Uh, it's really, really incredibly exciting about what is possible when you have a two order of magnitude shift um, in cost of returning from space. Um, and that is kind of the genesis of what we're working on. Um, it's a really cool opportunity because there are all of these broad places that we can, uh, that you know, benefit from low cost return from space. Um, from life sciences to resource return um, and manufacturing. And we're really excited about that. So yeah, any, if anyone has any questions, happy to take it, whatever you have. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Justin. Uh, great presentation, love the idea. Uh, especially the idea of uh, delivering stuff to Antarctica and really beating out that, uh, that one year, uh, one time a year accessibility. That's very mm. exciting. Absolutely. Um, a lot, some of the other use cases seemed like they sort of were reliant on, on other technologies, like the um, delivery of a defense product within 20 minutes, uh, assuming a, a very, uh, a rocket that's on call, as well as uh, in-space manufacturing, assuming uh, a sufficient market uh, to Certainly. sort of things. And so I was wondering if you could talk, I guess, about both of them. Mm -hmm. um, about yeah. first the uh, availability of rockets for 20 minute delivery to anywhere. Absolutely, so the awesome thing about this is you can actually load the capsules up with the supplies, launch them, and they can stay in orbit for about a year to two, five years, and then you can call them down. So what you would do is build up a constellation of these so you're not limited by launch on your cadence of return, um, but then you can just call them down whenever you need. So they would actually be storing the supplies up there. Um, on the manufacturing side, it's actually a really awesome time because on the ISS, there are people demonstrating all of these technologies right now, um, and we can actually fit those people in our capsules, which is really exciting. Um, and they're really looking for a way to scale up right now. Awesome. Can I get an idea of what the cost difference is for someone who wants to host a manufacturing payload on the ISS versus inversion? Absolutely. So yeah, so uh, Inversion is going to be launching from anywhere from two to $10 million per customer, um, depending on mission capabilities and stuff like that. If you wanted your own dedicated mission, say you needed to be able to return in exactly you know, a month, 
that would be anywhere from you know sixty million dollars on a on a dragon capsule up to two hundred million dollars um, on a um, uh, on a X thirty seven B. Um, the International Space Station is a really interesting uh, point because um, there's a lot of capabilities that they don't have that we allow for, um, which is really the the difference that we're targeting. ISS is fantastic for research um, and basic research, but even that is clogged up. There's like about a six year rate wait right now to get onto the ISS, uh, which is stifling growth. So we're we're excited to expand that also. Sounds good. Uh, coming up to the audience here, um, and there are some questions about uh, orbits. Are there any restrictions on orbits? Any uh, orbits that you tend to go towards? Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, great, great question. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so to, uh, for like a global concept, for if you wanted access, uh, uh, be able to access the entire world, you'd probably go to a polar orbit. Um, but generally, we don't really care too much. Um, the great thing about rideshare is we can just get plopped into orbit. Most of the customers care about zero gravity uh, or microgravity, um, and that's really what they're looking for. Um, generally, you would be on uh, a LEO orbit if you were on a smaller launch vehicle, and you could be in sun-synchronous orbit um, on a larger launch vehicle. Very good. Another question that came in is the landing accuracy, and I'm sure landing safety when it comes yeah. to delivering goods to a place. Um, Absolutely. We've all seen uh, return rocket uh, first stage boosters, at least. So could you talk a little bit more about, I guess, what the current status is and what the vision is? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in general, space capsules are returned passively. Once you do your deorbit burn, there's not steering when you return. So you have this large landing, landing radius. Um, the nice thing is, so we're going to be starting with that also, just because it's a lot simpler. Um, but because of the size of our capsule, our landing radius is actually uh, significantly smaller than um, larger capsules. Down the line, we're going to be implementing controlled deorbit so that we can actually target and land within a football field um, so that customers are able to get their uh, their payloads back much quicker. We actually don't see, um, with the proper controls, we actually don't see an advantage to a, um, a winged aircraft, like a space plane coming back and landing on a runway for accessing of the experiments. We think we can get our landing radius down to the same size as them. To the same size, what was the uh, ending landing radius you were targeting? Uh, as a, as like a return to, um, like a horizontal landing, like a space plane. Understood. Um, and the last question, uh, someone had a question about uh, the use case of debris removal. Um, are, are you, and I know that it's debris removal is a re regulatory issue as well, or debris is a regulatory issue. And so how does Absolutely. your company lead with debris um, mitigation? Absolutely. So that's not our focus right off the bat, um, because you don't really care if your debris gets back to earth intact or not. Um, but our, ca our capsule would have the capability to uh, deorbit a, a certain amount of mass. So um, if you were to add on a, uh, like a grappling system, you could do that. But uh, that's not something we're focused on right now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Justin. Great presentation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Justin. All right, Charlie, you're up. All right. Let me share my screen. Make sure you guys can see it okay. Okay. Can everyone see that okay? Yep. Yeah. Looks great. Okay. Awesome. So first of all, thank you Starburst for hosting us. Uh, you know, very excited to be involved with the kind of aerospace community in LA and um, I'll introduce myself and kind of how we funded ZapBat. And then today I'll kind of walk you through the story of ZapBat. We're not a strictly aerospace focused company. We're a battery tech company, but we're currently working with Northrop and a few other people to kind of bring the battery technology we're taking to the commercial space to leverage for kind of the aerospace community. So to introduce myself, like why am I an expert in this topic? Why do I care so much about batteries? And I've worked on batteries for a long time, coming up on a decade now. I spent six years at Northrop Grumman in applied research. And basically my job there was to touch as many battery chemistries as I could around the planet from OEMs to national labs to startups and try and get them to integrate into different military applications. And then besides that, I used to and still work in wildlife conservation and I put battery systems up in the Arctic to study polar bears down in the rainforest of South America. And so I've had a career of kind of putting batteries in this extremely harsh environment and pushing them to kind of their extremes to see how batteries really operate inside a system. 
Now, how that led to Zapbat is after years and years of doing this, I realized that batteries are coming up on a big problem. And the problem isn't a battery problem. The problem is time. As we're electrifying the world, what we're seeing is that batteries are creating a solution, but they're also creating a big challenges for business and consumers building their technology around a battery. So what are these three problems? As we see it, charge time right now takes way too long. Lifetime, disposing batteries every few years is not anywhere near sustainable. And the liability right now to businesses and consumers is posing big risk for businesses trying to expand. So let's actually talk about like why this is a time problem. So I'm really happy we included Lyft today because an emerging industry we're working in is micromobility. So your birds, your lifts, your limes, you know, all those companies. So right now, each of those companies has to charge around 25% of their fleet every night. Each one right now taking around five to seven hours to charge. This is also costing them warehousing, labor, vans, transportation, all these different things. And that means for a single operator in the last two years, they've spent 12,000 years of time just charging their e-scooters or e-bikes, which is an egregiously big number. But what it means is that almost 50% of their net revenue is spent around charging. So they don't have a battery problem, their battery is creating a time problem. Secondarily to that, every one to two years, they're having to replace these batteries because of how they're being utilized and how they're being ridden by different riders. For anyone that's ever ridden an e-bike or an e-scooter, the kind of saying is ride it like you stole it, right? So it means every one to two years, they have to buy another set of these batteries for their fleets, which is creating a big problem because the Department of Energy has said that less than 5% of every lithium battery that we're using right now is being recycled. So despite taking all these raw materials that are very precious out of the ground, we're not creating an ecosystem that's sustainably creating a battery into a business and for the environment as well. And lastly, despite the fact that this battery has cost them thousands of years, they're gonna to have to buy another one every one to two years, a single failure is getting them kicked out of different cities, is causing Ring to recall their video doorbells. And as we're electrifying the world and putting batteries more and more places, it's getting to become a bigger and bigger problem. And now our kind of solution to the, or our secondary thought to this is that the world is seeing the solution of the miracle battery. I'm sure that everybody has seen kind of two articles come out right now, which is miracle battery is going to save the world or battery explodes. Now, what we're trying to say at Zapbat is that even this miracle battery is going to come with similar challenges. You're going to, you're going to take efficiencies at high power. You're going to have, in certain cases, longer charge times, and you're putting more energy in a smaller area. So it's coming with an increased safety risk. How big is this problem going to be? It's going to be gigantic. I think all of us can attest to the fact that in the last few years, we're adding more battery powered products around our house. And in 10 years, as electrification starts to grow, batteries are going to be everywhere. So this time problem, we're really at the beginning of, and we at Zapbat are trying to get ahead of. So what did we do to solve this problem? What we call it at Zapbat is unlocking an overlooked chemistry. And for reasons of our pilot projects coming out this year, I won't be able to talk about our chemistry today, but if anybody wants to follow up with us, I'm happy to disclose that um, in a different setting. But our technology is about taking a proven battery chemistry that's been around for almost 20 years and solving this time problem. The first piece of that is what we call our battery AI system. To understand where energy and time are being spent in a battery, you really have to understand how a battery is existing and all these different operational effects. And our philosophy is like, what better way to do that than for our batteries to tell us how to save a business time and how to make our battery more efficient. So something as simple as an e-bike trip for one of our customers, we can crunch down into all these different battery factors that tell us about how they're spending energy, wasting energy, or wasting time. And the reason this is important is that our Zapbat batteries are telling us how to make their system more efficient. And then it's also showing us how to make our own batteries more efficient. So how this applies to aerospace is there's a lot of talk about electrification of aircraft, right? But the challenge of adding batteries into the system is that your battery is now going to be defining your mission or how you're going to be able to operate. Because as opposed to people thinking a static kind of operation, a battery is going to come with all these different caveats into how something like an air taxi can operate in a system. 
And so what we're trying to show for our aerospace customers is what is a battery actually costing you? Because let's take the example of an air taxi. If an air taxi takes five to seven hours to recharge, if you land on a 50% battery, are you going to be willing to take off on a 50% battery? You know, that's a, I feel nervous leaving the house on a 50% phone life or 50% battery life on my phone. So it's really about for batteries to enter into aerospace in a big way, it's really about understanding before we can say that they're going to solve all these problems first. Now, our second piece is our hardware system, which for oversimplified, uh, the standard way to operate a battery is called the standard battery management system. And since we're talking about aerospace today, anybody that's worked at a big prime knows that there's a lot of managers. And <laughs> sometimes you need to take away a manager to be able to operate more efficiently. And so what we've built as we call a battery optimization system. So opposed to just management with our chemistry, our AI and our hardware, we can now charge our battery systems 10 times faster, taking hours into minutes. We can increase the cycle life of a battery from one to two years to 15 times of what it currently is. We're running that onboard analytics to understand how a battery is affecting the business itself. The chemistry we're using has no risk of thermal runaway, which for aerospace applications is very critical. And then using one of our own hardware designs is what we call DC to DC integration, which I'll skip for today, but allows us to seamlessly integrate into a variety of applications. So going back to those three problems, what we've done is take charge time for these businesses from five to seven hours to under 20 minutes their lifetime of their battery from one to two years to 25 plus, depending on how they manage it, and from a chemistry that goes from flammable to one that has almost no risk of thermal runaway. So I'll skip the chemistry piece for today, just given um, this audience, again, happy to follow up with folks about it. So our big question, right, who cares? Obviously batteries are in a lot of things, but who is this gonna be a critical change for is kind of our business model. And so what we're focusing on is companies that are implementing batteries as part of autonomy, where the operational cost, mobility as a service, transportation as a service, the batteries really defining how profitable these companies can become. Companies focus on their sustainability goals and user safety. And then obviously the key one of uptime, you know, as Lyft talked about having a 24 seven operation, if your battery takes hours to charge, it's gonna be challenging to have hardware uptime when software can be running all the time. Now, something unique about ZapBat is a lot of folks see battery applications as kind of discrete units, right? A golf cart battery, a leaf blower battery are all different things. Because of our AI and hardware, we don't. And so we've built this kind of seamless modular system so that we can turn our e-bike battery into a golf cart battery into a, this battery extremely quickly. And so we like to call it, it's hardware at software speeds as opposed to thinking of these as all discrete industries. And so our focus is about impact on companies profitability, number one. So for our mobility pilots, we're gonna be running this year and are currently running right now, we've, we've been able to reduce their operational costs between 23 and 50%. And again, just by reducing the time it takes to interact with these battery systems. Secondly, as part of you know, what I've worked in for wildlife for a long time, the environmental impact of these battery systems. For, for some of our pilots, we've been able to reduce their battery waste by up to 90%, meaning you may be able to change the shape of your e-bike or your frame or your scooter, but that battery still has 20 years of life in it. Secondly, we've also delivered battery to my old friends at Polar Bears International, because we wanna create a community of people that care about solving these hard problems and we're partnering with scientific communities around the world to say, how can a battery help you do kind of your critical science missions and how can we help solve your battery problems? So where we're at right now is we're launching this year. So ZapBat is currently in eight different pilots right now in four different verticals. And we're gonna be coming to market with all these different versions um, around the May timeframe of this year. And then from there, we kind of want to grow to some of our more strategic markets that are a little bit bigger and complex. But again, our AI is kind of helping us fuel the fact that these smaller applications are feeding our development into bigger, more complex systems. And lastly, um, I'll talk about our team at a high level, uh, just in the interest of time for Q&A. But what we really focus on is building a team of engineers and product designers and Loved the panel today talking about culture and building the right culture of a company because uh, one of my 
friends told me the other day a, a really good quote I liked of culture eats strategy for breakfast. And so our founding team is built to try and solve these energy problems, but make them more relatable to how we interact with batteries. And then for the different industries we're going after, we've built an advisor team of mobility, um, infrastructure, IoT, consumer, all these different folks who can give us insight into how people can better interact with batteries. So that's what we do at ZapBat. If anyone would like to reach out and learn more, feel free to email me at uh, charles.welch at zapbat.com. And I'd be happy to provide more information on the technology, give a little bit deeper of a dive and kind of talk about how we feel the future of batteries is going to look like. Thank you so much, Charlie, for that presentation. Um, I think it's extremely clear that uh, the age of batteries is here and that there are huge problems. And so I, I think it's the perfect time for this company. Um, I also love the, the quote, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, <laughs> it's a hungry monster. Um, I had a couple of questions about um, how battery management currently happens. So if I have a AAA, a AA battery, um, it just turns either on or off. What is the kind of battery management next level that um, maybe more complicated batteries get engaged in or the batteries that you work on get engaged in? Yeah, great question. So the kind of historic version simplified is kind of cutoff, so safety cutoff. So a AAA battery says when the voltage is here, it's full. And when it's down here, it's empty. And then the new ones kind of monitor basic things like temperature and you know uh, other basic aspects. The future is gonna be like a battery to a certain extent is like a living thing because as it starts to decay over cycle life and temperature and how you're using it, it's always changing how it can be used. And so a lot of people like to think of batteries as a static metric where I buy this battery and this is the specs I get but it really changes day one you use it and it's gonna be changing every single day you use it in every different application. So the future of battery management or as we call it optimization is really understanding the entire life cycle of a battery and then having software to show us where that battery is in its life cycle and how we can optimize it for the business or the consumer. Sure. Uh, we have a, a question that comes in from the audience um, of what the upfront cost of dollars per kilowatt hour of some of your batteries? Awesome. Favorite question, uh, because <laughs> I- the favorite question too. What? It's always the audience's favorite question too. Yeah, so I'll answer this kind of boldly. Um, dollar per kilowatt hour doesn't make sense at all, because the question I had with one of our investors recently was that if you use your battery more than once, then your dollar per kilowatt hour doesn't make sense unless you include cycle life. And so if I'm buying a X amount of dollars per kilowatt hour, it's more important to amortize that over the lifetime of the battery. So this will probably be a shocking number, but for our systems, our dollar per kilowatt hour at our high cycle life is five cents, which people are talking about lithium ion as we want to get sub $150 per kilowatt hour. But in my opinion, as I've worked for a long time, it doesn't necessarily represent how a battery is costing you things in your business. It's just a target metric that people have tried to build to. Nice. Um, Trade-offs exist everywhere. And so I was wondering under what circumstance and what business case would a customer prefer to buy a standard battery as opposed to your AI enabled battery optimized battery? Yeah, that, I, that's a good question. So I would say that there are customers out there that absolutely want to just hit the cheapest battery possible. Then they don't have let's say the extra money to spend on a more advanced battery. And that might be fine. Let's say for somebody selling a simple IOT device or something. And that's why we're really focusing on businesses building their operations around a battery and its performance, uh, because we don't want to target folks that are looking for a one year disposable type product that doesn't necessarily want to see benefits of a, a more enhanced battery. Nice. Um, so, you talked about some of the character, some of the environmental characteristics that affect a battery's performance. Mm -hmm. But what do you do to improve a battery's performance if it says I'm too hot? Um, is that necessarily mean turning down the the uh, voltage of the battery and therefore inhibiting performance? Or how do you how do you sort of manage how do you do that dance? 
Yeah, definitely. So what we like to kind of sit is like, I'm about to get too hot. If you keep doing what you're doing, uh, we like to kind of avoid the whole, I'm in a bad situation. Now I've got to control performance on a system. And so a lot of it is once we, once the AI will characterize a battery in a system to a certain degree, we can kind of predict where it's going to get under a lot of operational parameters to say, if you keep doing this for another half an hour, you're going to enter red zone where your battery might start to have to throttle performance to make sure that you don't, you know, create a, a critical risk. Right. Um, I have a, a, just a few more questions about the sort of control, um, and getting data back from these batteries. So they're out in the field. Do you deal with the, you know, it sort of feels like you're turning batteries into an IoT thing. Are you getting like, those back from all these batteries? Are there other IoT infrastructures that you're relying on? Or is there sort of common use case typology that you can rely on? Oh, this battery is gonna be used like this so we can just hardwire this sort of performance um, variations into the battery itself. Yeah, so the interesting thing that we do is our batteries technically are all networked so that we can upload battery performance of all of our different applications back to our cloud and then say, you know, maybe, you know, maybe for a mobility company in Sweden versus a mobility company in San Francisco, they might need a slightly different tweak to their battery performance based on weather or certain topography of the terrain and all these different types of things. So, um, we're trying to get a sense of understanding of how energy is being used more so than how the battery system is operating. And it's akin to like, we like to give a lot of fun analogies like, you know, um, you know, we don't wake up and eat all of our food for the day for breakfast and then wait till we're almost dead to eat again. You know, it's like, it's, we've solved our energy problem culturally by having breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And part of that comes in understanding, you know, when I need to eat all these different types of things. And we feel like the future of energy is really understanding how energy is being used in a battery system and then how that can operate actively, you know, and, and do different types of things. Awesome, thanks for the analogy. And that's time. Uh, thanks for the uh, presentation, Charles. It's always good to see you. Yep, thank you. Thank you guys. All right. Thank you everyone for, for coming to join us for this. Um, and celebrate the kickoff of scale. Um, thank you to Van and Adam and Liz and April for helping support today. Um, thank you to all of our speakers for making this happen. Um, and if you want to get involved, if you want to learn more about scale, or if you want to uh, refer startups who are working on cool projects, or come share some wit and wisdom by being a mentor, or just invest in the startups or otherwise be engaged in the community, um, keep up to date on our events, please go to our website, uh, scalearrow.la, uh, and you can reach, reach us there, fill out forms, read a bunch of more about the program. Um, and of course, feel free to reach out directly as well if you have any questions. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thanks everybody. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>